The first lesson is found in the book of Romans, chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, and he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why... It was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The word of the Lord. The psalm reading is found in Psalm 33, beginning with verse 1. Please follow the screens. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Word of the Lord. The second lesson is found in the book of Romans, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained, gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if... While we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Gospel readings found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, beginning with verse 26. And Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately 
he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all, seed, all the seeds on earth, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, but without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, please be seated. Heavenly Father, thank you for being in our midst this morning and drawing us close to you by the power of the Holy Spirit as we hear your, your word kind of unfold this, this morning. God, give us ears to hear and hearts to behold. And Lord, just make our hearts good soil for your word to, to grow as, it, as, as you intend it to. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, uh, you know, we're, this is the fifth or sixth, sixth in the uh, series, uh, Because He Lives. And so all, all of Easter we're doing, Because He Lives, such and such is possible. So we have victory over sin and death, and we have freedom and all this kind of stuff. Today what we're talking about is because He Lives, we have hope. And there's a concept I want to share with you today that I think is really, really important for discipleship. Really important for being uh, citizens of the kingdom of God. And uh, I think when, when this kind of thing locks in for us, the way it did for the disciples, it can be a real game changer for us. So uh, we, because he lives, we have hope, uh, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope because it reveals the power of God's word to us, okay? And so in Romans 4, uh, Paul was talking about Abraham. Against all hope, well, what was, what was in other words, that should not have happened, Right? against all hope. What shouldn't happen? Abraham at 100 and Sarai at 90, Abram at 100 and Sarai at 99 shouldn't be having a baby or shouldn't be able to have a baby. So against all hope, Abraham in hope, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations just as it has, had been, just as it had been said to him. Do you with me? Do you hear that? Just as it, who said it to him? God. So if God says it, it is. Can we say that? If God says it, it is. I just, it's so important. And he said, so shall your offspring be. And so it was. Now, Abram, Abram in Genesis 12 was 75 when God started making these covenant, blood covenant promises and vows to him. And there were lots of them. And, you know, Paul talks about Abraham believed it was credited to him as righteousness. He gets to 100-year-old Abraham. Uh, but now here we got Abram at 75. And God, he has this relationship with God. He can, he's talking to God. He, he gets the word. God says, all right, get up and go from your father's country. And he does get up and go. But, by the, but, but we have to be aware that there is a 25-year period uh, between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 when God actually cuts covenant with Abraham. 25 years there of a lot of trial and error, a lot of real boneheaded moves on Abraham's part uh, where he, he, he has to really trust God and learn that if God says something, it is. And so over that 25 years of the love, his love for God, his trust in the, the word of God, the promises of God, locks in to the point where this friend of God, because Abraham's one of the few people in the whole Bible that's referred to as a friend of God. So this friend of God, uh, the love and trust is so locked in that God cuts covenant with him and, and begins uh, to, to keep all of those promises that, uh, that he promised him about uh, tribes and nations and so forth. At, at 199, uh, Abram's body, Sarai's body, uh, common wisdom, logic, would say, no way. What do you have to hope for? 
But if God says it, and he says yes, then it's yes. God's yes is always yes. God, okay, you don't have to repeat it, but I'm going to say it again. God's yes is always yes. We, we, we need to trust the power of God's, God's word. Romans 4.20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. We are people of hope and promise because God has fully persuaded us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, that God has the power to do whatever he promised. See, our beginning starts with that kind of a faith and trust. Abram's beginning started with a whole bunch of impossible promises. But as Christians, our beginning starts with, you don't really become a Christian if, if you don't believe God raised Jesus from the dead. It kind of, it, it, like our whole faith kind of hinges on that, all right? And so if we can believe that, and, and we do, that Jesus Christ died on Friday and on Sunday that God raised him from the dead and that he rose and that he appeared to over 500 people and that he ascended and seated to the right hand of the Father, well, if that's where we start, then in our hope journey, we're starting with the belief that if God says it, it is because God promised that all of those things would happen. Paul says that, 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 that God's promises, this is great news for us, that all of God's promises are not just for Abraham. The Old Testament promises even are for us too. If God promises it to his people, well, we're his people too. And, and it, it's for us. And so Paul writes, but also for us. I love that, but also for us. Never, you can never think, well, not for me, okay? Maybe for so-and-so because they're so much better than I am. Well, we talked about that last week. Nobody's good but God. It's by the, by the righteousness of Jesus that we become righteous in God. And, and, and so we're all the same. And if God says it, you can't say it's not for me. It's also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. And just as God promised. He promised it in the Psalms. He promised it in the prophets. He prom Jesus himself promised it dozens of times throughout his, his ministry and his preaching. He keeps his promises. And we need to lock that in. That is how we operate in, our, in hope. Abraham believed what God said uh, to be true and lived, lived according to that belief. Now, in the ancient world, this is very important, because in the modern world, if we talk about believing in something, most of us, or maybe you don't, but I think of that as being a cerebral exercise. Believing is here, always here. Logic, 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 belief, belief, belief. But in the ancient world, that word for believing or belief is very similar to how we treat the word trust. So it's, it's different. If I say I believe something, I, I get that uh, you know, theoretically. If I say I trust something, it's because I've put it to the test. All right? So trust is an action word. And so in the, in the ancient world, if I said I believe something, it means that I trust enough to live in it. I trust, trust enough to act on it. So if you trust someone, you show them that you trust them. Um, for example, ladders. I've been accused of being afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of heights, but I am afraid of ladders. Because they post the weight limit right on the side of the ladder. And if I exceed that, then I don't trust it. So I don't climb it. All right? You with me? If you, if you trust something, you're going to show that you trust it. I, I trust the bench can hold me, I sit in it. I trust the resilience of my pants, so I wear them. Um, now, I told the other, 
I've lost 84 pounds. Thank you. But I still don't trust ladders, okay? But if we trust the word of God, we need to live in it. We need to act on it. It needs to be, we see it happen and unfold. The kingdom of God comes near as we act in trust on what God has said and what God has promised. And that's not always easy. It, 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 it's really not. It's one of the toughest things about that is the timeline. Uh, one, one of the toughest things to do as proclaimers of God's word is to trust his timing. Why hasn't it happened yet, God? I was on schedule. You know, we were supposed to get this done by December. It's May. What? We can't rush God. We can't rush God and we can't slow him down. It's going to happen in his time. If we trust his word and his timing, we will see a harvest, the harvest that he intends. This is, this is he, here's Mark 4, and Jesus is teaching his, his disciples. By the way, just as a plug, we're, we're in, uh, still in Mark on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, and uh, we're on chapter 6 now. We just talked about this recently. But in, in Mark 4, these parables, Jesus is teaching his disciples, look, if you want to do my work, which is what disciples do. Disciples want to be just like their master. He says, and if you want to have heaven on earth, if you want to experience the kingdom of God come near, then here's some things that you need to know. This has to lock in. And so in Mark 4, Jesus is telling a couple of parables. And yeah, there are thousands of people around, but Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's actually going to explain this stuff to them off to the side, but, but he doesn't explain. We need to, we, we learn through Jesus' actions, what all this stuff means. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man, and here's an important word, this is why I like the New King James Version for this one better than the NIV, uh, should, the word should is so important here. A, the, a, a person, a citizen of the kingdom of God should scatter seed on the ground. And we know from the first parable that Jesus taught that the, the seed that we scatter is the word of God. It is the word of God. And some of that seed's going to land on the, on the road and the birds will gobble, gobble it up. Some of it's going to land on shallow ground and it's going to die. Some of it's going to land in the weed pile and the weeds are going to choke it out. Some of it's going to land in good soil and it is going to grow and reap a harvest. And so Jesus is repeat, almost repeating himself here when he says we should scatter and, should, and, and we should sleep by night and we should rise by day. Why? Because we cannot manipulate the word of God and make it do what we want it to do. Like I said, we can't rush it and we can't slow it down. But if we scatter it like we're told, God will make it grow the way that it's supposed to grow. And it will. It, and the seed should sprout and grow. It'll do what God tells it to do. For he himself does not know how. See, we, it does, it's not important for us to know how. It's important for us to trust God and do what he tells us to do. And trust that if we are proclaiming his word, and that word gets out there, and it lands on good soil, it's going to grow. See, the, and into what God says it's going to grow into. For the earth yields crops by itself. First, the blade... Then the head, after that, the full grain in the head. And this is the second part of what we do as disciples. We cast the word, God makes it grow. There's a harvest ripe, but when the grain ripens, immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And so we get the joy of, of being harvesting the thing that God has grown. And we need to be ready to do that too. But it all hinges on the word of God and his power. And we put our hope in that. Because if we cast it out there and it lands on good soil, it's going to grow. And we have to trust that. We have to trust that. What's great about this for me is there have been times in my life where I, I've thought, you know, I need a little direction, Lord. <laughs> you know, I love you. I trust you. I want to serve you. I, I need you to tell me what you want me to do so I can do that. And sometimes I'm expecting God to come and say, well, Jeff, I, I would like you to run along this, like Philip, run, just go run along the chariot and be very specific with me and, and immediate. But that's, not, that's often not how he responds to me. He gives me verses like this that tells me, oh, in the meantime, you, you may have a specific plan that you want me to do immediately, but in the meantime, 
I get, I get it. I'm supposed to be scattering seed. I'm supposed to be proclaiming the goodness of God and Jesus Christ. I'm supposed to be telling people, God loves you so much that he gave his only son to die for you. So that if you believe in him, you shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, that's the word of God. And if that goes out from my mouth, it's because he said it and it's going to go into good soil and it's going to grow and it's going to become what God says it's going to be. We have to trust that. And that's a good enough job for now, right? That's a really good job for now for, we, for us disciples. Citizens of the kingdom of God should proclaim the word of God to the world that he loves and he will redeem all who believe. So this is the other part of that parable uh, in Mark 4 that we read. And what's, what I love about this is it, when Jesus talks about the mustard seed, he, he, he wants the disciples, they really lock in the picture. This is a parable about the kingdom of God. It's a picture. I'm going to give it to you. I need you to get this. That when you cast something out there, I have plans for it, and it will, it will grow into the plans that I have for it. This is what Jesus is saying. So here's what Mark 4 says. This is the parable. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds of the earth, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air must nest, may nest under its shade. So if you take a mustard seed, which is a, like a little tiny, tiny little brown gray thing that looks exactly like dirt, okay? It's so small and it matches in the dirt. And you take this thing and you throw it out into the earth. Are you ever going to see this again? It's like me golfing. I'll tell you what, I, I haven't golfed in like 30 years. I used to really love to golf, but I went through golf balls like crazy. Because I'll hit a golf ball and I'll... I'll it'll, I, I'll just never see that thing again. The mustard seeds are so small, you cast that out and you never see it again. But Jesus says, that you, that's not your problem. Your job is to cast it out there. My job is to make it grow and his DNA is essentially written on his word and it'll grow into the thing that he says that it's going to grow into. And so like that mustard seed, even though you don't see where it lands, if it hits good soil and it grows, it's going to grow into this great big giant tree, this herb tree. And I, I, told, I think I've told you this before, but I can totally attest to that. We had a one acre field uh, next to us when I was growing up, between I was 12 and 18 years old, a vacant lot. And, and the, whoever the owner was of that thing, man, they never did anything on that lot. But mustard got on that field. And you, you never saw the seeds, but I'll tell you what, you saw the bushes because they were like seven and a half feet tall, and they were thick. And man, you could, make, you could push your way through a, 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 a big field of mustard, but you got to work because it's so thick. I liked how it smelled personally, but uh, it was, it, I've seen this in action. And man, it's like when it grows, it really grows. It grows overnight. It's just, bam, it's there. This is the word of God. It, it's not up to you what's, how to manipulate it, how to force it to grow. We're not the ones that have to make hard, rocky hearts into good soil hearts. The Holy Spirit does that. Our job is to cast the seed, to cast God's word, and trust that it's going to do what it says it's going to do, because if God says it, it is. God's word is hope, God's word is salvation, God's word is transformation, God's word is redemption, God's word is righteousness, God's word is justification, God's word is life. It has to be all those things. All of those things have to become because God says so. Isaiah 55, this is God speaking. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. If God says it, it is. Psalm 33, David knew this, not a perfect guy, made a lot of mistakes, but he trusted and loved the Lord and he trusted God's plans. And he said this, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. He, he could make mistakes, but God doesn't make mistakes. His, his glory goes out. And so Paul says, 
you know, we, we boast. You know, we don't manipulate things, but we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and produ- perseverance uh, produces character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame. And, and, and there's, there's some crazy theology out there these days uh, that, that is kind of mixed with new agey world theology or whatever and it tells us well, if you can name it and you can claim it and you can say it, then you, it'll manifest. Like, there's all this manifestation stuff going on now. Uh, back when I was a kid, it was the power of positive thinking. Same thing. Right? You cannot manifest anything. But God can do all things. All right? And, and the, 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 the claim is that if you name it and claim it, if you become a Christian, then life is full of prosperity and nothing will ever go wrong. Everything will be honky-dory and you'll be blah, 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 blah. I don't know what Bible they're reading. Because that wasn't true for Jesus. It wasn't true for his disciples. But here's what was true. They suffered. And in the midst of that suffering, God was more evident and more present and more powerful than they could imagine. It was in the midst of suffering that the the truth of the resurrection of Jesus was revealed to them. It was in the middle of that suffering that their faith grew and their trust grew. And the more they suffered, the more they rejoiced because the kingdom of God had come near. And you can't shake that. There's nothing on earth better than that. God's love gets poured out to us this way. One of the greatest promises that God makes to us when we shamelessly uh, proclaim the name of Jesus is that God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Paul writes, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. But remember that, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Next week uh, on Mother's Day, because it's Mother's Day, we're going to talk about God's love. And, and uh, how because he lives, he lives in us. And if he lives in us, well, I, well I'm not going to preach another sermon today, but, but uh, it's going to be great. So bring, bring your moms, okay? Our job is to cast the seed, but our job is to be disciples. But we don't have to be boring disciples, right? Being a Christian doesn't mean that we have to be boring. We, ha- we don't have to be boring when we proclaim the word of God. David says this, I love this. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. So Paul and King David are on the same page, thousands of years apart, and they both agree that citizens of the kingdom of God should be able to do things and have a good time doing it. That God gave us joyful skills and gifts and talents that we can use to do these things. It's not about standing on a soapbox, you know, in a park uh, preaching. It, it could e- easily be as valid, and maybe even more so, to, to come and, and do crafts with little kids at VBS. Because if that's your gift, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pour in the love of God into them. And if you get to share God's word along with that, it's even more powerful. We need to use the, the gifts and skills that God's given to us. David says in Psalm 33, he says, sing to him a new song. I love that, the, that Jesus who makes all things new, the God who makes all things, likes a new song. He wants us to make new things. He wants us to be creative. He says, play skillfully and shout for joy. You know, what's your skill? When you, what's the thing that you do and all of a sudden, eight hours later, you realize that you've been working on this for eight hours because you've been having so much fun doing it? That's the kind of thing that you should be employing for God's house, for God's purpose, for God's word, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And then it'll be really effective because when, when we use God's gift of imagination, 
right? And creatively, cre- with, and creativity and all of our God gives and skills to communicate the love of God and power in his work. When we pr- praise God creatively and skillfully, it connects with people emotionally. And then that's that head heart drop that we've been talking about. That it, it, when you use your gifts and talents and your skills and you preach the word of God that way, it connects to people in their hearts and that's where the good soil gets that's where rocks get mulched into good soil. You, you with me? Okay? So th- that's why he wants us to use our creativity. Always remember that ultimately as people of resurrection hope, we're proclaiming God's love for everyone. Okay? When you preach the word of God, when you proclaim the gospel, when you can somehow convey John 3.16 to people, you're pouring God's love into them. And it's all about that. That's because he loved us that Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, we didn't have to be good for him to die for us. We were enemies with God and he still died for us. That's love. And then I want to just end today, again, encouraging you, if you haven't signed up, like I said, VBS, really good place to creatively show the love of God for little kids who are going to be impacted forever, forever by that experience. But I want to invite you, not force you, but invite you to pray this prayer with me. This is Psalm 33, the end of Psalm 33. Let's make this a prayer to the Lord and and, uh, encourage you to pray it out loud with me. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord even as we put our hope in you. All right, praise God. Let's uh, get ready for communion.